Welcome everybody to Book by Book for January 17. And so we tonight we are continuing through Jeremiah and we are going to be uh, walking through chapters 21 and 22. And these uh, these chapters are fairly well linked thematically as they're um, t- tying into judgment against the kings specifically uh, and their rejection of the Lord's uh, commands. Um, and there's an extension of possible uh, rescue for the common people uh, if they are willing to turn away from their their sins. Um, but ultimately, it does come down to uh, you got to trust the Lord. And so, uh, so yes, yeah, so we're going to be just looking at chapters 21 and 22 uh, with a couple large sections that we'll read, but a few more so like shorter sections. Um, so yeah, so let's jump in. We're going to read chapter 21 verses 1 through 10 first the word of the lord came to jeremiah from the lord when king zedekiah sent to him pasher son of malchiah and the priest zephaniah son of maaseah they said inquire now of the lord for us because nebuchadnezzar king of babylon is attacking us perhaps the lord will perform wonders for us as in times past so that he will withdraw from us but jeremiah answered them Tell Zedekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I am about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I will gather them inside this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in furious anger and in great wrath. I will strike down those who live in this city, both man and beast, and they will die of a terrible plague. After that, declares the Lord, I will give King Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials, and the people in this city who survived the plague, sword and famine, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who want to kill them. He will put them to the sword. He will show them no mercy or pity or compassion. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. See, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. I have determined to do this city harm and not good, declares the Lord, It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will destroy it with fire. So uh, King Zedekiah is uh, now reaching out to Jeremiah. And uh, the Babylonian, we're we're given all kinds of uh, context, historical timeframes for when this uh, interaction happened. And so the... Um, Babylonian uh, final exile and sacking of Jerusalem was uh, 586 BC, but things had been happening uh, for uh, longer than that. There have been there was a previous uh, deportation of people from Jerusalem uh, uh, several years before this, um, and there was an earlier king who um, had made an alliance with the Egyptians. And they were uh, against the Babylonians, and that led to that deportation. And so now, uh, but the, there was a conflict back in Babylon, and that led the Babylonians to kind of retreat uh, and gave a little bit of a reprieve for Jerusalem. But now, here they come. Zedekiah uh, had decided to stop giving his tribute to the Babylonians. So he stopped paying his taxes, essentially, to the Babylonian Empire, uh, which Nebuchadnezzar was like, well, I can't have that. And so he uh, sent the armies to go and um, sack the city and set up a siege against the, uh, the people of Jerusalem. And the siege is something that is intended to uh, lead the people to desperation, where they will lose uh, Whose will will to continue fighting and resisting because they're going to run out of food, their health is going to get worse, run out of water, all of these different things. There will be a famine of sorts in the land, um, not because of a weather pattern, but because of the um, the army surrounding the city 
that is just using up all the resources in the region. And so Jerusalem is going to be in a bad way. And so Zedekiah knows that uh, Babylon's coming, that Babylon is attacking. This is all happening. And Jeremiah has been telling them this, which is so frustrating as you read this. Like He's been telling you that this was going to happen and nobody believed because the false prophets were saying, peace, peace. We don't have to worry about anything. Uh, and uh, Zedekiah, or Jer Jeremiah was... Uh, holding on to the word of the Lord, uh, and they were rejecting it. So uh, he sends uh, Pasher and the priest Zephaniah to go and ask Jeremiah to bring a word from God. Now, last week we read about a, a Pasher as well. This is a different Pasher. So it's not the same guy who uh, had Jeremiah imprisoned and all of that. This is a different guy. Um, and so Jeremiah, uh, Zedekiah, Zedekiah is asking uh, Jeremiah to tell us about how God can save us. Tell us about how God can reach, his, reach out his mighty arm and save us and with signs and wonders like in the past. And so when we read that in, uh, in chapter, in verse, um, verse 2, the, he's referring back to the Exodus, how the signs and wonders of the Exodus were what uh, showed God's compassion and love for the people. Um, but now they are um, in, they're on their own, basically. They have rejected God enough. And so instead of the Lord using his mighty arm to fight for the people of Jerusalem, what the Lord says here is, I will use my strength now to fight against you. I would, instead of stretching out my arm against Babylon, I'm using my, my arm, my power, my strength to bring you down. And you have all these weapons in Jerusalem, but I'm going to turn those against you as well. And so this uh, siege on, um, on Jerusalem is the final, uh, the final countdown, if you will. It's, this is it. And uh, the people were probably pretty shocked to get uh, this final word here that, no, it, it, this is it. It's going to happen. The city will be destroyed. But um, there is a, a personal uh, or an invitation for the people. Uh, the, the house of David has abdicated their authority. They've turned away from what God has called them to do. They've rejected his instruction and called for repentance. Uh, and so the house of David is going to experience discipline. But God says to the people, if you leave the city now, if you go out and surrender to the Babylonians, it will go well for you. And, uh, and so there is that opportunity there. And we'll see that people, even when they are in Babylon in just a few chapters, uh, you know, God is still talking to them in exile. God is still trying to help them uh, while they are out of the land that God had promised to their ancestors. Um, but this is still something that they are not really in favor of. But part of the framing here is, you know, God is inviting them into a way of life, a path of life. And uh, I will often say that the law is called, uh, is referred to as the path of life in the Old Testament. And anytime God calls people on in a particular direction in scripture, it's an invitation into the life of blessing that he has designed for them. And so for the people, he's putting it right before them. The same kind of language that was given to them, to the people in Deuteronomy, choose life and you will see all these blessings, choose death and you will see, or sin or rebellion, however you want to say this, and you will see all of these curses. And part of the curses we read about in Deuteronomy is like a foreign nation will come and take your land. And so it is coming to pass exactly as the Lord said it would back in Moses' time. And so this is a, uh, you know, the, the king is asking the prophet to give us a good word. And instead the prophet says, things are not going to go well. This is going to be, this is going to go poorly for, for everybody. And so let's continue on uh, chapter 21, verses 11 through 12. And this is focusing specifically to uh, the royal house. Uh, verse 11, 
Moreover, say to the royal house of Judah, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says to you, house of David. Administer justice every morning. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed, or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. So this address to the house of David is not so much an invitation for David, uh, for Zedekiah and his, his descendants to repent as much as it is a reminder of what they were called to do in the first place. What is a king's responsibility? Administer justice and look out for the vulnerable, for the oppressed, the weak, the poor, uh, the orphan, the widow, the, the foreigner among you. All of these, as we uh, have talked about the quartet of the vulnerable, the king is supposed to look out for those who do not have power. And, and so he is telling them, like, I called you to administer justice, to do these things, to watch out for the oppressed, and you rejected that. And now uh, king, uh, the king of, of Jerusalem, he is going to be rejected by the Lord. So the, the implication here is they're not fulfilling their duty, and so the fire is coming in judgment. And fire is something that is intended to be uh, destructive or pu uh, purifying. And in this situation, the destruction of Jerusalem is partly to purify the, the city of its, uh, of its, of its sinfulness, of, it, of its wickedness, to remove the stain of sin uh, and, re and rebellion uh, from, the, from the place. And so, uh, so that's a warning to the city, or to the, the leaders, the, the house of David. The next section, uh, 21, 13 through 14, is a warning to the city as a whole. And so uh, chapter 21, verses 13 through 14 says, I am against you, Jerusalem. You who live above this valley on the rocky plateau, declares the Lord. You who say, who can come against us? Who can enter our refuge? I will punish you as your deeds deserve, declares the Lord. I will kindle a fire in your forests that will consume everything around you. So this is uh, a a message to the, the, the buildings and the, the structures and the people living there thinking that they, because they are up on a hill, you know, they're, they can defend it. Well, they're, they're fine. They're safe. Um, but they're not because who can climb this hill? Well, God is higher than the hill and he's the one who's bringing this destruction to them. And so the way it, they talk about the city here, one of the things that was interesting as I was preparing was, uh, the word Jerusalem is actually not in the Hebrew text, uh, but it's inferred by the way that uh, they, they talk about it. It's uh, the city, you who live above this valley on a rocky plateau, declares the Lord. And so Jerusalem is on a hill, and there are you know, three hillsides, essentially, uh, that are so they can see a long ways away. And, uh, and so they're, they, they are in a good strategic location. When David first captured the city, uh, you know, this was generations after the people of Israel had come in to conquer the region with Joshua, but they never conquered Jerusalem. And the Jebusites were living there. And they were, the Jebusites were able to defend it because it was the high ground and it was hard to come and attack. And so the people were getting complacent there. Uh, so they, when they say, who can come against us, who can enter our refuge, uh, they think there's nothing that can happen to them. They're safe. They're high up. Earlier, they were talking about how this city would never be destroyed. This is God's favorite place. His temple is here. And they're treating the temple as a kind of good luck charm to keep them safe. And now they're, they're considering their strategic advantage over other armies uh, because of just their elevation, but the Lord is coming against them. Their deeds have brought this destruction on them. So the Lord says he's going to kindle a fire in their forests uh, and consume everything around you. Now, Jerusalem did not have a forest. And so what's happening, what's most likely is this is referring to is the, the royal palace and the temple had many many, many cedars from Lebanon. And the palace in particular was uh, called, it was called the forest palace because of how many 
massive beams from these huge trees from Lebanon uh, were in the palace. And so even the palace and all of its strength and security and the power it projects is not safe from the coming judgment. And all of this, again, is because of their rebellion against uh, against the Lord. And so um, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah. All right. That's everything uh, that I want to talk about there. So chapter 22 then uh, continues on with this, this message that the judgment that's coming as Babylon is encroaching onto uh, Jerusalem. And so uh, we'll start with 22 verses one through nine. This is what the Lord says, go down to the palace of the King of Judah and proclaim this message there. Hear the word of the Lord to you, King of Judah, you who sit on David's throne, you, your officials and your people who come through these gates. This is what the Lord says, do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. For if you are careful to carry out these commands, then kings who sit on David's throne will come through the gates of this palace, riding in chariots and on horses, accompanied by their officials and their people. But if you do not obey these commands, declares the Lord, I swear by myself that this palace will become a ruin. For this is what the Lord says about the palace of the king of Judah. Though you are like Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon, I will surely make you like a wasteland, like towns not inhabited. I will send you send destroyers against you, each man with his weapons, and they will cut up your fine cedar beams and throw them into the fire. People from many nations will pass by this city and will ask one another, why has the Lord done such a thing to this great city? And the answer will be, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord, their God, and have worshiped and served other gods. So now Jeremiah is instructed by the Lord to go to the palace and bring this message. We've seen him go to the temple and bring a message of correction at the temple. But now it's like, no, go to the palace and tell the king to his face what's about to happen. And so um, the call here again is, you know what you're supposed to be doing. You are called king of it, Judah and Jerusalem to watch out, do what is just and right, rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, the widow. Do not shed blood in this place. And, and so here it again is this message to protect the vulnerable, the quartet of the vulnerable, the marginalized, the weak. Um, and there's a promise here that if they do that, there is a day coming when the kings will come through these gates. Now, it's unclear if this is a uh, maybe still there's opportunity for repentance and transformation, or if it is a promise to a future king. If a restoration of the line of David, if the if the king will repent, um, and so there is this opportunity for transformation somehow, some way. And so the what the Lord says about this, though you are like a, the Gilead to me, like the summit of Lebanon, uh, these are very beautiful lands. And so what he's saying is like, though I I think you're you're beautiful, you're attractive, you're something that I I love to 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 have uh, to be able to see and enjoy. I'm going to turn you into a wasteland. This whole region will be destroyed, and and this ultimately is what happens with uh, the Babylonians coming and wiping out the people. Um, but it's going to be so bad that foreigners are going to like murmur about it. Like, can you believe what happened here? Why would God let this happen? And, and so this is, they, this is when the Bible says you will become like a byword. This is what that looks like. It's like, we don't really want to talk about it, but can you believe this happened? Um, and they'll know the reason that foreigners will know that this is because they abandoned the covenant with their God. This happened because their God is powerful. And they didn't take their God seriously. So this is what is 
coming about um, for the people. Uh, so this wasteland will be something that will, uh, yeah, people will definitely talk about it. And so, um, and again, part of this is so sad. And like, we, we read this, it's like, this is like God's promised land, the, the land that he gave, promised to Abraham and Abraham's descendants. And for them to lose it is amazing because they, they didn't get it on their own in the first place. Like the Lord fought for them and they didn't honor him. They didn't trust him uh, with their, with their whole life. And so, uh, and their whole, the co- they didn't follow the covenant, the path of life. So that continues on in chapter 22, verses 10 through 12. Do not weep for the dead king or mourn his loss. Rather weep bitterly for him who is exiled because he will never return nor see his native land again. For if this is what the Lord says about Shalom, son of Josiah, who succeeded his father as king of Judah, but has gone from this place, he will never return. He will die in the place where they have led him captive. He will not see this land again. So do not weep for the king, for the dead king, or mourn his loss. So this is kind of enigmatic here. And so what we want to recognize is that Shalom is Jehoahaz, who is the son of Josiah. Jehoahaz is the name that he took on when he became, uh, when he became king. And so uh, uh, Josiah, uh, Jehoahaz Shalom uh, is this exiled king. And so he uh, was the fourth son of Josiah, um, and he came to the throne in 609, uh, and he um, was exiled by the Egyptian king. So I mentioned this earlier, uh, uh, Necho II, and not Necho, like the wafer. But um, so he was taken to Egypt by the king of Egypt, and he died there. And so the exiled king is Shalom, who will never return. The dead king refers to Josiah, and many people were grieved that Josiah was what died. Uh, and Josiah's death was a great tragedy because he was a good king and he was bringing good reforms to the nation, but he got into a partnership with Egypt and uh, he was killed by uh, in that war, and so he died too early. And like, it's one of those things where it's like, what could have happened if Josiah lived? Could he have brought about the reforms that Jerusalem needed? Uh, you know, one of the, one of my projects over the last several years, I've just been reading presidential biographies. And, you know, one of the, king, the kings, one of the presidents who, uh, in the 19th century, who probably could have really done some great stuff was uh, James Garfield. He was pretty popular. Uh, by a lot with a lot of people, he seemed to have a good handle. He was well respected, but he was shot, and he he died. But he didn't die from the wound of the bullet. He died from the infection uh, from the bullet injury. As people kept trying to find the bullet and get it out of him. Later, doctors would say, if we had just left the bullet in James Garfield, he probably would have lived. But like it's one of those those things where he was only president for a short while, and uh, and. People wonder, like, what could he have done? Uh, because the the rest of the uh, 19th century was kind of a dumpster fire uh, after Garfield. Uh, there were several scandals and different things. But, you know, this this idea of a leader gone too soon, that's Josiah. And so don't weep for Josiah. He actually, you know, died honoring God. He died in a place where it's like he didn't bring about more shame. He was trying to bring more honor. Whereas Shalom... He is exiled. He was shameful. He did not do great. Um, and so the, uh, the, the command here is like, you should weep for, for Jehoahaz, Shalom. Um, or yeah, weep bitterly for him uh, because of the exile. He's never going to come back here. And part of this is a foreshadowing for the, uh, many of the people who are going to go into exile in uh, in just a few months, plus possibly, and they will never come back to Jerusalem. 
uh, Shalom is a forerunner of sorts for the grief and the heartache of exile. So, um, so that is Jehoahaz, the son of uh, Josiah. Now, this next section, chapter 22, 13 through 19, is going to be talking to another king. Uh, um, this is a message of judgment on Jehoiakim. And so um, these kings here at the end, they all kind of like condense in. They have shorter periods of time where they rule. So Zedekiah was the one who said, hey, go see if we will, if the Lord will save us. And now Jeremiah is speaking against Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim um, is a, he was Another one of Josiah's sons. So this is where it gets messy because uh, Jeconiah was uh, Jehoahaz. There's so many kings, all with J names. Jehoahaz was taken by Egyptians. Uh, then Jehoiakim comes in after him, and uh, and he's also uh, taken. Um, and so, yeah, so verse 13, chapter 22, 13 through 19. I'll just read it. And we'll talk about it. Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, not paying them for their labor. He says, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms. So he makes large windows in it, panels it with cedar and decorates it in red. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Did not your father have good food and drink? He did what was right and just. So all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and the needy. And so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? But your eyes and your heart are set only on dishonest gain, on shedding innocent blood and on oppression and extortion. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my brother. Alas, my sister. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my master. Alas, his splendor. He will have a burial of a donkey dragged away and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem. And so a woe is a message, is a, a, a prophetic warning. Uh, so anytime you see woe, you should say, watch out, look out. And, and so the, the, the message against Jehoiakim is he has exploited his people for his own gain. Uh, and so he has in uh enslaved the people of judah and jerusalem and made them build his palace and the uh ornamentation of his palace these large windows and these cedar uh cedar uh planks and beams and all these things cedar was so expensive so valuable uh and so he's like he's living uh in his wealth essentially um and so this um also he was building up his own wealth and he had to pay a heavy tribute to Egypt uh, at the same time. Uh, and so he is uh, kind of getting deeper and deeper into, uh, into debt and um, continuing to bring that hardship, passing that pain onto his people. Uh, and so the, the contrast here in verse 17, um, Jehoiakim your eyes and your heart are set only on dishonest gain, on shedding innocent blood, and on oppression and extortion. Whereas his father before was defending the cause of the poor and the needy. Uh, and so things went well for him, but not they're not going to go well for Jehoiakim. Uh, and so there's a bit of uh, sarcasm here in this passage as well, as the Lord is like, does cedar make you a king? Does all this ornamentation make you important? No, that's not, that's not what makes you a good king a good king. Uh, and so the, he did not know the Lord, which is really the greatest of uh, things. The, the greatest of insults you can say to a king is, you know, not knowing the God who established your throne. And so instead of being like his father, Josiah, Jehoiakim is being more like his grandfather, Manasseh. And Manasseh had a long reign, one of the longest reigns uh, in all of the kings of Judah, but he was thoroughly wicked. And so Jehoiakim maybe watched grandpa and was like, no, this is a good way to go. You can have a good long reign, uh, but it is not going to be 
that way. Uh, and so Neko, um, the uh, king of Egypt, and so his decisions and the animosity between Jehoiakim and Jeremiah, which we'll read more about in 26 and 36, um, suggests here really that Jehoiakim is pro-Egypt. Uh, and so they're trying to say like, hey, maybe Jeremiah is pro-Babylon because he's saying, listen, Babylon's coming. And so there's like a inner tension. There's like some court intrigue that's happening as they're trying to uh, pit people against Jeremiah, even the Jehoiakim is terrible and awful. And it gets confusing. It gets convoluted here. Um, but these last few decades and years in, in Jerusalem are a mess because the people uh, and the kings are just trying to save their own skin. And so they're making these alliances and then they're cutting back on the alliances and, uh, and it gets very uh, convoluted. So Jehoiakim, who wants to be important and powerful, uh, the Lord says he's just basically going to be, he's going to have a meaningless death and he's going to be buried like a donkey out in the in, outside of the gates. Uh, last week, we looked at uh, Jeremiah going to uh, the place where he broke the pot. And that that's basically the dump uh, where, you know, that could be part of the way that Jehoiakim's uh, remains. Like what, you're, what the Lord is saying is like, just as you broke a pot, it was worthless. Uh, you throw it away. Jehoiakim, you're a worthless king. You're going to be discarded like an old donkey. So this rich ruler, a poor country, um, you know, it was not unusual for the conflict here for the people. That's not unusual for today. A lot of the, you know, despotic kings and rulers in our time, they're very wealthy while their people are very poor. Um, and so uh, Jehoiakim, lived in a non-Davidic way, contrary to the way God wanted the kings to live. And so he will suffer a shameful death in the end. Um, all right, let's keep going as we look more at the consequences for uh, Jerusalem's disobedience in chapter 22, verses 20 through 23. Go up to Lebanon and cry out. Let your voice be heard in Bashan. Cry out from Abarim, for all your allies are crushed. I warned you. When you felt secure, but you said, I will not listen. This has been your way from your youth. You have not obeyed me. The wind will drive all your shepherds away and your allies will go into exile. Then you will be ashamed and disgraced because of all your wickedness. You who live in Lebanon, who are nestled in the cedar buildings, how you will groan when pangs come upon you. Pain like that of a woman in labor. So here, um, the the warning now is, you know, the people of Jerusalem, they had made these allies with these other surrounding neighbors, Lebanon and Bashan and Abarim. And the warning now is coming to them and say, like, hey, this is coming for you too. And all of these uh, allies, these uh, the shepherds here that the people have been trying to bring on their side, the people of Israel bring it on their side to say, keep us safe. Uh, they're going to be driven away because they're going to have to deal with their own problems uh, as well. And so the uh, this coming judgment is something that the whole region is going to experience. They're not going to be able to get away for. And so they're like, no, God, we don't have to listen to you. The Lord, what do you know? We're going to make our own allies. And, the, and here the Lord is saying, it will come swiftly. It will be shameful and you will be disgraced. And it will be great pain, like uh, that of a woman in labor. This, uh, this pain that is coming is going to be very intense. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what's happening there. So I'm going to keep going. All right, so now we come back to Jehoiakim, a different king. Uh, so we had Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoahaz, Zedekiah. Josiah, we are talking about all kinds of kings right now. So they gets kind of convoluted. So um, verse chapter 22, verses 24 through 30 is where we will look now. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my hand, I would still pull you off. I will deliver you into the hands of those who want to kill you, those uh, you 
you fear, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon and the Babylonians. I will hurl you and the mother who gave you birth into another country where neither of you was born, and there you will both die. You will never come back to the land you long to return to. Is this man, Jehoiakim, a despised broken pot, an object no one wants? Why will he and his children be hurled out? Cast into the land they do not know. Oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime. For none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. So Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim became king at the age of 18 and as an 18-year-old, immediately had to deal with the Babylonian siege that is happening uh, in uh, in around the city. And so and the Babylonians were starting to take treasures from the temples uh, in 597, uh, and they, um, yeah, so they, this is part of what, uh, you know, the first time that they came. And so from... Ezekiel, we also learn that there was this other exiled group of people that were taken at that time as well. And Ezekiel was counted among them. Um, and so in the uh, book of Second Kings, chapter 25, uh, we also learn that Jehoiakim lived among the exile uh, that was uh, released from prison in the years that Evel Meriodach um, and the son of Nebuchadnezzar became king. And so he, uh, Jehoiakim is taken to uh, Babylon and he lives in exile and he uh, is in released from prison in 562 BC. So remember the, the exile is 586. Jehoiakim is in prison from, from around that time to about 562 BC. And so this is a king who was taken and thrown into exile. And so the way the Lord talks about this signet ring, a signet ring is a ring that would be used to like seal uh, a scroll or a letter uh, to say that this is from a person of authority. And the signet was the symbol on the ring uh, was that sign of the authority of the person who is sending the letter. And so even so the Lord is saying, like, even if you carried my authority as my symbol of power and like um yeah if you were this i would still take you off and throw you away you are worthless to me as a signet ring and so that's what happens to jehoiakim he is taken off the throne and thrown into exile and so um yeah so this is uh this message of this king king who is childless whose sons will never rule and reign this is what happens uh, to Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. Um, but again, go back a little bit to Jeremiah. Just last week, Jeremiah's message with the broken pot. And here, Je Jehoiakim is the broken pot that he was referring to. Like this, the, the, the line of David as rejected covenant that God had made with them. And so even after exile, there will be people who will rule in Jerusalem in some way, but they'll never have the splendor uh, and the, the authority that the kings of uh, Israel and Judah had uh, as descendants of David. And, and so when we get to the Messiah, the, the time when Jesus comes and people are longing for the son of David, there's this picture of a Messiah that will come, that will carry on this line of David. And Jesus, as a descendant of Mary and Joseph, kind of both sides of the family, go through David uh, enough to say like, yes, he's fulfilling that part of the family. He is a, an heir uh, to, to what God is doing. And so he's the son of David. He is the son of man. He is the Messiah. And these Kings where they all failed, Jesus uh, proves himself faithful. So the, yeah. So this chapter, it ends with, just this declaration that Judah will be desolate and the the Kings will not be there anymore. So that's where we're going to stop tonight after looking at these two chapters. Um, 
And so with all the kings coming in and out of the picture, I, I know it gets a little confusing, um, but I think one of the things that we should remember with these times where like a, a nation is collapsing, those are very confusing times. Those are overwhelming times. And so, um, you know, even as I was preparing, I kept going like, okay, who's the king that did what? And, you know, I've been reading the Bible for most of my life. And I, I do these read throughs every year. And even at the end, uh, you know, when I get through the book of Kings and I'm just like, why, what is happening? <laughs> there are so many times where I just get kind of overwhelmed by the chronology of all these Kings and, and their own wickedness. And so Jeremiah is a prophet during several Kings lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And he is giving a word from the Lord to each of them. Uh, and they continue to prove to be disobedient to God. So, uh, so let's stop there. Any questions or thoughts or comments on? I have a couple. These? Okay. Jane. Yes, Jane. Hi. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, so we started out with Zedekiah, who was making the request of Josiah, Jeremiah, yep. to plead to the Lord. According, I have my old Kings list here that you gave. Yeah. Once upon a time. Is Zedekiah Jehoiakim's son? Um, I'm, I need to pull up that list myself. So, um, sorry, Kings. There you go. I can't read that. Uh, <laughs> Judah. Um, he's the one that comes after Jehoiakim, uh, 597 to 586. So, is Jehoiakim... Another brother, um, or son of jo Josiah, or is he? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, I guess it doesn't really matter. What's confusing to me is that why did God switch in the middle of this? I mean, he went. Zedekiah was talking, and he's saying, "No, you're not getting anything." And then, boom, he switched to a new king. Is it because he's just bringing in the history, or I don't? I just the. Don't uh, the kings changed, so it switched because of a switching king. Mm -hmm. so, uh, sorry, I'm pulling this thing. My internet is slow. Okay. But when I looked at this list, I realized that Jeremiah was the prophet from Josiah through Zedekiah, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, that helped. Uh, kings of judah go let's try again what why are you not giving me information internet kings of israel and judah that's what it looks like israel and judah yeah for some reason my bible app is not being helpful right now kings of Judah, go. All right, so. Yeah, so Josiah has three sons who serve as king. Okay. Those kings are Jehoiakim, Jehoahaz, and Zedekiah. Oh, Zedekiah is his son. Yes. And so Jehoiakim, C -H -I -N. the son of Jehoiakim. Okay. But when Zedekiah is no longer on the throne, Jehoiakim is placed on the throne in his place. Okay, that's not what it looks like on here. Um, because it says Jehoiakim is 598 to 597. He didn't rule very long. Correct. And then Zedekiah is 597 to 586. Yes. Okay. So but BC is going backwards, bigger numbers to smaller numbers. So the, so Josiah, Jeho Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah. Oh, wait. Yeah, you're right. I got it mixed up. I got it switched. Zedekiah will reign after Jehoiakim. Yes. Sorry. Okay. No. So, that's okay. Yeah. Um, but he also a son? 
of Josiah? So yeah, Ze Zedekiah was Jehoiakim's uncle. Zedekiah was a son of Jos Josiah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, okay. it gets very confusing, and and this last part is, and it is a mess. And so the, um, yeah, Zedekiah was the king after the Nebuchadnezzar's first sack of Jerusalem. The he also was uh, watched all of his sons be executed, and then Nebuchadnezzar took his eyes. Ah. So, I mean, it was like, it's a very tragic, Brutal. tragic story. Um, but yes, all of these, these last few kings. So jo Josiah was like such a, such a promising moment for Jerusalem. But his alliance with Egypt led to him being shot by an arrow and dying. Uh, and he, um, yeah, he died. So, <laughs> Hmm. Um, okay. No. And Zedekiah becomes king. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's a big mess. So, but I mean, that's part of the story is just the messiness of it all. And all these kings who were trying to save their own bacon uh, ended up getting in the fire in the fire themselves. So, mm. yeah, it's a mess. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other? Questions, thoughts? I, I got one, of course. Yes, Harry. <clears throat> so when I'm noticing in the king's lineage, it seems like a lot of times the ones that ruled the longest were the evil ones. Um, talking ye... about, uh, which one was it? When the, you know, the one that, la that lived for 40 years and was evil? Manasseh was 55 years. Yeah. Five years, sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it just seemed like the they the ones that I you know that, that weren't very good. They seemed they were evil. Seemed um, to reign long. Yeah, sometimes, but not always. Like Josiah reigned thirty-one years. That's a good long time for a king in the ancient world. Right. Um. So. Yeah. yeah. So we can't make a long reign as like just like. God ignoring their wickedness. Um, but yeah. No, I, I guess I would just want it swifter, you know. Okay, you did wrong. Here you go. <laughs> Not for yes. a generation down. Yes, but that is your justice bent there, Carrie. You want justice, you want fairness, you want right and wrong. Um, but that is not that's it's not, not the same time to, that's not the timetable that God works on, is not when we want justice all the time. So <laughs> but yeah. But, you know, where was it, Jehoiakim? Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, eight end of this, you know, mess. <laughs> Here you go. We're being attacked. Here you go. Here's your land. Yeah. Jehoiakim was uh, three months and 10 days was his reign. Uh, and then Jehoahaz reigned for three months after his dad, Josiah, died. Um, so some of these people got taken out real quick. Yeah. So. I just can't imagine being 15 years old and then being handed your country and it's being attacked. Right. Yeah, that would be uh, very, that'd be very hard. So, yeah. Oh, by fire kind of scenario. Mm hmm. For sure. Um, yeah. All right. And, Jeremiah through all this. Yeah. I, I mean, mean he, I'm actually hard when, you know, Jeremiah gets a little angry. Mm -hmm. A little frustrating, you know. God, you know, strike them all down. He, he, I was waiting for that to happen. I read ahead, and I was like, "Oh yes, he finally got mad." <laughs> yeah, Jeremiah, he is sad, and he has moments of anger. Uh, he's one of the most honest and human people in the in the Old Testament. Like he has the whole human range of emotion, and so um, yeah, it's one of the things that I appreciate about this book is he doesn't try to hide anything. That's one of the things I appreciate about the Bible in general is it's honesty. There's so much brokenness in the world. And the is Bible doesn't try to hide that. Was he known as the weeping prophet? Yes. Yeah. 
And that's a lot, a lot of Lamentations in particular, and we'll get to that when we're done with Jeremiah. We'll go right into Lamentations, uh, is basically uh, his, his sorrow over the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Any other thoughts, questions? I wish they would name their children a little bit different from each other. They got uh, Jehoiakim. Yeah, they would probably say the same thing to us when it's like Jake, James, Jason. Oh, yeah. it's like it, Their names make sense to them. It's just hard for us, right? So, uh, but like, go, oh, William, Bob. <laughs> yeah, but like if you could imagine like Brian here in our group spells his name with a Y. My dad spells his name with an I. Same name. <laughs> um, different. But different, but the same. And sometimes that's how it's it, Ryan, you know, similar to Byron. Right. Yeah. yeah. So like if, if, like if Brian Cox and Brian Duman and Byron Newby were all at church together and they were leading a committee of some sort, people would be so confused uh, as they're reading through the minutes. Did they misspell somebody's name in here? Um, but yeah. So that's sometimes how we feel reading through these names is like, but you know, we're all used to it. So yeah. Um, so sometimes you just need to repeat, read through and like slow down. We're like, now who is this? And get back on, on, on track. But um, yeah. They got me. I was like, okay, play a Kim and Chin. Yeah. Jason, I was just kind of curious, like I think about like God or like, you know, the Old Testament and kind of bring when God turns his wrath, right? You know, oftentimes yeah. there's warning, sometimes there's not like, oh, I reached out and touched the ark and was, you know, mm -hmm. and fell dead, right? Or people that transgress, sometimes they're punished immediately. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but just kind of what, what um, Carrie was mentioning about like, hey, these rules last for a long time. Why? I, I, I just sometimes I wonder about God's justice like that. Why in that moment did he choose to have immediate justice versus letting that string out for 50 years? Like, is it the state yeah. of the people and the king? Is it like, you know, what, what are those factors? It's, it's kind of hard to understand sometimes. Right. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm not trying to get you to explain it. I just, it's just an observation. Oh no, yeah, it is. I mean, there, there is a mystery here that we can't necessarily understand because even like, Solomon, you know, was not a good king. He was, he was the first king to enslave his people in, you know, a roundabout way. He didn't call them slaves, but they were working on the temple uh, and his palace for a long time. And, you know, he was the first king to go and make these alliances with other nations and marry all these women. You know, this is a... And he had a, a pretty long reign and he was pretty terrible. And, um, and we lift him up as like this with, you know, the man of greatest, the wisest man who ever lived, but turns out to be the biggest idiot. And uh, yeah, I don't understand it. And it is one of those things that frustrates me. <laughs> like, why didn't you fix it sooner, God? Mm -hmm. But yeah, and we can't always know. And so there may be some other things happening as well, like the northern kingdom, Israel, maybe uh, was more wicked. And, and God's like, I've got these two kids who are just a mess, and I'm trying to figure out what to do. Um, but That'd be yeah. a good analogy of a father, right? Like I have more patience <laughs> with my children at certain times than I do at others. Yeah, maybe, uh, you know, and, but, but it, there is no like simple answer to it. And one of like the theological term for these kinds of questions is like the, is, with the problem of evil in the world is a theophany, not a theophany. No, that's a appearance of God. Oh no, I lost the word. Ah, there is a term for it. Oh man. Total just like, escaped my brain um but people theodicy that is, there it is theodicy which is uh you know how do we handle uh the lack of justice in this world when we see such corruption and like why do bad things happen to good people while the good things happen to the bad people and part of the uh 
part of the tension that we have to live with is knowing that we are not the final arbiters of justice, but that there is a day coming when the Lord will bring justice. And so when we read the Psalms and we read those imprecatory Psalms where the Lord, where David cries out, like, Bob, uh, God smite my enemies. You know, David, you know, didn't go around killing all of the people that he wanted to. He killed a lot of people as a man of war, but there were a lot of times where it's just like, God, I don't even know what to do. I'm handing them over to you. And, um, and that's part of how we can look at some of these, like, mis- like, why did this king get to reign so long? You know, it's like, it's not up to me. <laughs> like, I don't have to have the answer knowing that ultimately God, it's your, you're the one who brings justice and I'm going to wait and I'm going to trust you. But that's really hard to do. And I know it's hard to do, but, um, yeah, that's part of what, part of what I think we can take away from history of Israel and Judah is, you know, God warned them and warned them and warned them and warned them. And they just never listened. And so eventually justice came. But yeah. Um, all right. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Mm-hmm. We're going to get into a point where Jeremiah is going to start uh, talking more to the false prophets uh, and talking to the people in exile. Uh, and then it'll turn to promise of restoration. You know, the prophets usually end with a promise of restoration. Uh, and so we'll get there. Jeremiah's just a really big book and he takes his time. So, um, but uh, we will, uh, yeah, we'll wrap here and we'll be back uh, next week. And so, uh, yeah, so uh, just so you know, we do have our together weekend, Friday, Saturday. We'd love to have you there. If you're not already signed up, it is free. Uh, doors open at, on Friday at 630 and we'll go till nine and then Saturday at nine and we'll go till about uh, noonish. And so, um, yeah. You're more than welcome, married, single, divorced, widowed, wherever you're at on that spectrum. We'd love to have you. So uh, yeah, with that, I'll uh, let you all go. Have a great night and see you soon.